There are some hands that we've done on the breakdown that kind of play themselves, yet they still have really interesting elements, and we need to break it down anyway to get to the nitty gritty of stuff. Today we have a hand that is in no way standard. It, there is nothing that plays itself about this hand, and I think it is super interesting. It is from the PCA with about four tables left. Jonathan, I love this hand. I know you love this hand. I like this hand, for sure. I'm not as enamored with it as you are, not because I don't think it's really fascinating and worth a great discussion. It is, for sure, and I highly encourage everyone to watch this video, watch this hand, and hear what we have to say about it. But I'm not so, like, you give credit, more credit to one of the players than I am willing to, and so we're gonna get into that. If I'm you sure. wanna see us argue, wait till the end of the video, because yeah. we're gonna argue about how good of a play a certain play is, which I think is great, and Jonathan doesn't think is and, as good. And the reason why you can say that is we already recorded that, so we yeah. know we're gonna argue. We know we're gonna argue, <laughs> for sure. Um, this was suggested by Chris and the Twitter Master on Twitter, of course, include a YouTube link and a timestamp if you wanna tweet a hand at us. And of course, if you're interested in what keeps the lights on and what that train is in the background, that's the Nitrogen Sports Poker Train piece. People, There's no train in the background, though. I mean, there is over there. I oh. pointed. Oh, okay. Will you please let me do oh, this my... Is, I'm this doing is the, a thing. This isn't the 360 camera. They can't see that way. Look anyway. Okay. <laughs> Turn around and look. There's a train behind you, but don't worry. All it brings is poker, sports betting, and casino games, baby. And it also pays out in 90 minutes. It's the best thing in the world. It's Nitrogen Sports Poker Room, <laughs> which is where the poker guys play. And you can play with us or play against each other in Nitrogen's monthly tournament that they do just for people who use the link that we post on our Twitter feed every once in a while, especially when we tweet about our videos such as this one. Check out that link if you want access to this amazing tournament where a thousand buy-ins are guaranteed. We've only ever gotten as many as about 80 players, so there's a ton of value. As Jonathan mentioned, there's also sports betting, there's casino games. You gotta get on Nitrogen and get you some poker. By the way, we've been joined by Philippe Oliveira at the feature table. You will recognize him. He made a deep run in the PSPC. Like then it becomes a, a war. So Mark Andre opening with Queen Eight. Of a well, like a, with a King Six. Between, uh, who's most efficient at stalling. At, at like stalling and these things that have nothing to do with talent. Agree. If there was a way to just stalling being completely out of the game, yeah, it. yeah, it's hard. It's better for everyone. Yeah. But like. Yeah, the problem is that it makes money. Yeah, exactly. And if some guys are stopping and you are not, you are losing. Right. Right. Twenty-seven. Yeah. Tough builds, it's like. Okay. I mean, whatever. If it's a table two or a rag, it, I mean, max people stalling. If it's like five pieces on the table, it's just ridiculous. So Three-way action. King, king, three on the flop. No, Mark Andre. Thinks the Jack thinks he's invincible. That'll happen. That's how I got married. <laughs> okay. Sorry. <laughs> My wife hates that joke, especially when I use it in every context possible. After I've said bink the jack? <laughs> <laughs> That's a different one, yeah. There's actually quite a bit to talk about so far, but let's start with the most interesting thing, which is the thing that just happened. I mean, Simon Dedman is the biggest fish in the world, am I right? He's calling with six high. Does he think that's good? What's wrong with this guy? Okay, obviously that's not what's going on. Yeah. Simon Dedman is certainly not efficient by any stretch of the imagination. Simon Dedman is setting up a play for down the road, assuming things work out the way he would hope, right? And we'll get into that probably as the hand goes on. But Simon Devin clearly is not thinking, you know, I, maybe I can make a straight, running straight cards or anything no. like that, or running trips, and maybe it'll be good. Um, no, he thinks, like, he can represent a king best by just calling here. Yeah, and we'll get to that a bit later, but first let's go a little chronological here, talking about preflop, because we both take exception, but Jonathan especially with 
Klaus Segebrecht's preflop call with the King-Six of Diamonds, this feels like a very strange and almost amateurish call for a guy who has really good results. Let's be clear, okay? I guess I could find ways to defend this if they were like 200 blinds deep or something like that, I guess. But the effective stack between Klaus and the other two players, Klaus has like 32 blinds or something, right? He's in the 30s. There's no way this is ever a good play when you have a player still to act behind you, two relatively weak ranges, a good player, by the way, who's going to squeeze a lot, or you're letting him in super cheap. Either way, it's problematic. You're going to be out of position to two other players with a weak hand that doesn't flop particularly well, although it did this time. I think this is a huge mistake, and I'm really surprised that a guy with, he's got about $2 million in uh, live results, does this. Maybe it's way, way, way in the future. We're all going to be doing this in 2025, but I doubt it. I doubt it as well. The best I can come up with for his reasoning is that Mark andre has a big stack, and he's primed to 4-bet ship if, if Klaus decides to 3-bet, because Klaus has been 3-betting from the small blind a lot. But... Klaus can't call with King-Six of Diamonds if that happens, so he wants to play the hand because it's still too good against Marc-Andre's range, but that's not a good enough reason when you're in the worst position at the table against two elite players. So let's move on, though. That's just a bad play. Yes. We agree with that. I actually like that Segebrecht just calls on the flop. I think raising would have been a big mistake because I don't really see how he could be repping anything but a king if he raises, and that's going to set off alarms for anybody who doesn't have a super monster. So calling is good, right? Absolutely. No, calling is the right play now that we're here. Um, but as Segerbrecht, as soon as Deadman calls behind him, there should be huge alarm bells going off. Now, it turns out Deadman has six high. Yeah. But what in the world is Simon Deadman supposed to have here when he overcalls on this board and this flop? Simon Deadman never has, like, pocket fours. No, never. He never has pocket sevens. He never has pocket queens, I don't think. I mean, it's like Segerbrecht looks like, between the, when Segerbrecht calls, it's like Demon always has at least a king, or I guess complete air. Right. But nothing in between at all. So Segerbrecht should be terrified of what Deadman has, much more so than even Marc Andre. Of course, because Marc Andre is just sea betting on a board that he's supposed to sea bet on. Of course. Of, yeah. And so what Deadman is doing here, as Jonathan is enumerating here, is pretty sweet, considering mm -hmm. like how Segerbrecht should be afraid, even though he has trips here. This is a really well thought out thing that Deadman is doing now. I think Deadman has kind of a multifaceted plan. Like, he's going to probably check most turns and see what Marc-Andre does, because yeah. if Marc-Andre can continue after getting called twice on the flop, Marc-Andre frickin' has it. Yeah. He never has pocket aces. He has it if Marc-Andre continues betting on the turn, and Deadman then knows to abandon ship. But if he doesn't, he knows that he is the guy who can have all of the king threes in the deck based on preflop action. He can have all of the nutted hands. So... In his mind, he can say, I can rep bigger hands than you can, Segerbrecht, because you're not supposed to have weak kings here, even though we see Segerbrecht does. I'm assuming Deadman is putting Segerbrecht on something like King-10, which is crazy considering that he's going to try to get him to fold later, apparently. Um, but that has to be what he's putting him on and deciding, okay, my range can be stronger than his range and I can be aggressive later and win this pot, which is a crazy plan, but it's really kind of well thought out and cool. It's well thought out and cool as long as your customer... Is, as long as you understand who your customer is and that he's going to be able to make that fold. Otherwise, it ain't so great. Right? Yeah. Well, let's see if it works out. I don't know. So an ace on the turn. Both Debman and Ladusa are now drawing dead. Men. Cool. So Deadman catches a small piece on the river after everyone checked the turn. Sigurdbrecht certainly read the book on how to slow play a hand. Didn't work out for him with the paces earlier. He likes it, though. Segerbrecht finally going to go for a little more value. Ninety thousand. Deadman with yet another pretty corny hand. 
And in a three-way pot, he's oh, gonna goodness. get in big trouble here. Simon. I mean, you had to expect that this was one of his options when he, when, you know, Brad, when you say, why is he still in this hand with 6-5 with a king-king three flop? He had a plan. He had a plan. <coughs> Surely he's not going to get Segebrek to fold this. Oh, I thought that was his cards for a second. <laughs> no, it gets, it gets a little confusing, that motion. We're used to just seeing the shape of people fold, and when we see them chuck a card in, everyone... I mean, I feel like if I were playing at the table, I'd have a hard time. I said that. I said because sometimes my I have involuntary uh, involuntary bodily reactions if I'm bluffing. Or, yeah. And so when if someone goes to chuck cards and like there's a chance that I might flinch or twitch. Something in your peripheral vision. Yeah. Look, I mean, Sagarek does not have the nuts. What was the pre-flop action? Lajusur. Yep. And it went call, call? Correct. And that is uh, continued flop. Everyone check the turn. So Deadman can have threes and fives. Yes. He can have a suited king. Nope. There aren't that many hands he can have. Yeah, he can have like an offsuit king three and king five. But... And I guess he might come along for the pot odds. He can also just have a bigger king. But I don't know if he can, if he's gonna raise it. Nice bluff if you have a bluff. He does fall. Oh, mama. It did work out. Simon Dedman's plan came to fruition. Of course, as we said earlier, he had to have a couple things go in his favor here. The board had to cooperate a little bit at least. You know, like another king probably wouldn't have been a very good card. <laughs> probably Stuff not. Stuff like that. But Mark andre checking the turn was a clear indication to Deadman that now it's basically a heads-up pop for him if he wants to try to take it away from Segebrecht. And Segebrecht pretty much always has a king, right? I mean... I don't know if that's true. If Segerbeck had called preflop with two eights, which I have to believe is possible, yeah, I guess so. since he called with king six suited, he might feel just obligated to call on the flop. Um, so maybe he can have a king and some worse hands also. Okay, but by the river, Segerbeck always has a king. When he bets. When, when Segerbeck bets the river, which we should talk about. Yeah. Should he be betting the river? I think he clearly should not be betting the river. Whoa, hot take. Let's hear yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely freaking hot take. <laughs> uh, to me, this is this is actually right up there with calling with king six suited pre out of the small blind when the button opens. I don't know what the hell is going on. He doesn't have a good kicker. Deadman absolutely looks like he could have a king. When it checks through on the turn, that's not a sign of weakness from Deadman. That's the important thing. It's a sign of weakness from Mark Andre. So now we can feel really confident that Mark Andre doesn't have us beat if we're um, Segerbrecht. But there's no reason at all to think that Deadman doesn't have a king, and we have king six. We beat two kings in the deck. It's, it seems absurd to me to bet here, and you're just setting yourself up to make a bad decision down the line, either to bet and call or to bet and fold. Whatever it is, you shouldn't be in this position. To me, this is a very clear check and figure it out right. once Deadman bets, and if as he we, bets. And as we can see, Segerbrek did bet fold. So this is a huge problem for Segerbrek that this is the line that he took on the river because if he bets and just gets called by Deadman, which Deadman would likely do if he had a hand like King-9 or something, yeah then he loses that 90k. If he bets, and for some reason in some universe, Deadman is actually making a move here, which seems impossible, but is actually true. Yeah. It's happening. Guess what? You still lose that 90k. So there's no way you're actually going to win this pot. So that makes it problematic. I guess he's doing, in his mind, a blocking bet, right? He's yeah. betting small, and he feels like Deadman's going to give him sort of perfect information. He doesn't have to pay off any more, because I guess he thinks he's going to check call. And Deadman has a lot of kings, too. So maybe in his mind, he's just trying to bet the absolute minimum that he's I mean, going to have to lose. He bet like half the pot, so 
Well, no, 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 because it was thir they put in ninety on the turn. He bet, on the he flop, bet ninety right? into one hundred and eighty three k. Oh, okay, yeah. So you bet yeah, about it's half not, the. Line. It's not. It's not super blocky. No, yet. it is not super blocky. And to be clear, Deadman always has at least a king if he has value on the flop. I oh mean, yeah. Like if he's not having some really really weird random float like he does, he always has at least a king once Segerbrek calls. By the way, if Deadman for some reason gives up on a plan, I don't think Mark Andre is calling with an ace. Like, no Segerbrecht way. always has a king, right? When he bets this river, having played it this way. If Mark Andre has ace queen, I know it may sound crazy, but I really believe that if Mark Andre has ace queen, it checks through. Segerbrecht bets the river. Deadman folds. I think Mark Andre is usually folding, unless he knows Segerbrecht's the kind of guy who's going to flat with eights pre, call on that flop, and then take shots on the river. Turn it into a bluff for right. really random reasons. Which seems weird when it checks players. through on the turn yeah. where you think my eights might be good. All right, so. Deadman, let's get to him. Okay. He, he got the indication on the turn when it checked through that Marc Andre didn't really have it. Now, some of the time, maybe Marc Andre is going to check it when he really, really has it. Yeah. But usually, at least one of his opponents, if not both, have a king as played on the flop. So Marc Andre is probably going to want to continue to build that pot if he really has it. So you can mostly discount Marc Andre. So it's just Segerbrecht, who is pretty much capped at king queen. It's pretty much it's hard for him to have much else. Maybe he could have threes full, although that's more likely to be a raise on the flop. I mean, it turns out he can have king three suited and king five suited. Right, we wouldn't know that. As right. Simon Debman, he probably expects Segerbrecht to be better than that if he yes. hendened him before they played on this day or something, you know. So he's thinking, okay, this guy's capped at king queen. Probably has some king ten suited, king jack off. And those are the hands that I'm targeting. And they really aren't supposed to be able to call when I am the guy who can have king three and king five and threes full. And Segerbrecht isn't supposed to be able to have those. And by the way, Deadman has all of the combos of those, even the offsuit combos because of the yes. preflop action. That's, that's absolutely right. And I will say this. When Deadman calls on the flop with this hand in this spot, and it checks through on the turn and Segerbrecht bets the river, Deadman is almost obligated to raise because he's put himself in this position, right? Like, it'd be almost crazy not to because why the hell were we calling the flop if we're not going to make a play at the guy who has a king but rarely has a full house? Yeah. Right? Like, so once he makes the decision to call on the flop, once it checks through on the turn, it's like kind of destiny that he's going to raise the river. Yeah. I think it's a beautiful play. I think it's one of my favorite plays that I've seen. Jonathan's a little skeptical because yeah. he thinks Segerbrecht is not competent enough to make this play against simply because of the preflop and, and river plays. I think some players just play hands poorly sometimes. I play hands poorly sometimes. I think Segerbrecht is probably better than this based on his results and doesn't always play this way. So I'm going to give Deadman credit on reading Segerbrecht correctly as a type of player who's going to understand the situation and be able to fold when he has just trips. I hear what Grant's saying, and it isn't crazy by any means, but I'm not as willing to give Segerbrecht the Benny of the Denny because... Even with King Six, he used up time cards, right? He used up his, his, some of his time extensions, which in my mind means if he had a better king, he's probably calling. If he has the King Jacks and the King Tens of the world, he's probably going to find a call if he really thought about it with King Six. Well, it depends on what type of player he is, because yeah. he, if he's actually incompetent and doesn't understand distribution at all, that might not matter. He okay. might categorically think, okay, he's repping a full house, I yeah. have to fold. Maybe you're right. Maybe you're right. But now you're arguing for his incompetence, which is I the opposite of your I think both ways point. I win. Both ways I win. <laughs> I think you shouldn't be targeting players who don't seem to understand value and, and can't think through situations. And I'm not saying necessarily this is true for Segerbrecht, but this one hand points to that anyway. True, but if you're Simon Debman, you yeah. hand in this guy, you see him at the table, he looks like he knows what he's doing, he has a kind of a professional air about him, you assume certain things, right? And you assume he's the type of guy who's going to understand the situation. I mean, I hear that, but Simon Debman's been on the, the tour for a long time, and so has Segerbrecht, and Simon Debman knows a whole lot more about him than just what his hen and mom says. And, you know... If you play long enough and you play enough 25Ks, and Segerbrecht has played some 25Ks, you're sometimes going to hit some big scores. Now, Segerbrecht has some very nice results. Don't get me wrong. He finished, like, third in the monster stack for 500K the first year it was. So I, I don't mean to, like, say this guy has nothing going on or anything close to that. He did full trip kings, and, some, and like, the worst players in the world obviously wouldn't. But, man, this was not a well-played hand by him in my opinion. No, it was not. But I guess what you're saying, though, if you think Deadman made a mistake, is that Deadman's just clicking buttons and hoping it works? I'm saying I think Deadman pro I, I worry. I don't even know. I worry that Deadman got lucky that his customer happened to find a fold here and maybe he could, maybe he should be picking slightly different uh, victims. Maybe. I think the situation kind of lended itself to Deadman making this play. He understood the situation well enough. He understood his opponents at least well enough that we see that it, the results worked. Mm -hmm. I think it's possible Deadman did this perfectly and that this is one of the better plays we've ever seen. It's possible. I'm not sure that Deadman didn't get lucky that Segerbeck decided to fold. We'll never agree. I think this may win the title 
for most controversial between the poker guy's hand maybe we've ever done? Yeah, the least we've agreed about a play. Like, the, the, the gap so. between us about how impressed we are with Deadman's play. Although I still think you think it's kind of good. I do. I, I do. just think it's elite. So yeah. that's the difference. There may, maybe this is top three then, because we've definitely fought about other things yeah. too. But this is one of the most biggest disagreements we've had. Actually, you should listen to our podcast if you really want to hear us get into it. Oh my God. Yeah. It gets a little intense. Uh, what do you guys think though about all these plays? Like, I, both of us, myself especially, very critical of Segerbrecht's decision making. Grant loves Deadman's decision making. I certainly like it. We have no problem with what Marc Andre is doing at any point. Do you, who do you, whose side of the fence are you ultimately on here? Do you think this is a great play by Deadman or just a, a play where maybe he got a little bit lucky because Segerbrecht sort of shouldn't have even been there in this spot anyway and sort of like fell backward into a fold? Um, that's which is more what I think. So let us know in the comments. We really look forward to seeing what you have to say. Yeah, not only let us know which of us you agree with about how good Deadman's play was, but also if you think it was a bad play. Of course. And you disagree with us entirely. Also, if you think Segerbrecht's plays were actually good, let us know about that. Yeah, um, by the way, like, yeah, some people may think, like, that's a terrible play. You got really lucky. Segerbrecht should have called. Yeah. Like, that would, be a, that would be a whole other thing. That, right? that would be an entirely different way to think about the hand, of course. <laughs> and uh, if you want to see other hands featuring Simon Dedman and Marc-Andre Ladoucer and a three-way hand that's pretty interesting, well, that sounds like a good idea, doesn't yeah. it? You want to click right up there. I already mentioned our podcast where we spent a good 55 minutes really intensely getting into it about this. It's, it's as heated as we've gotten on our podcast, I would say, in at least a year. Um, we really disagreed about Deadman's play there, and we sort of found some common ground eventually. But if you want to hear all the thought process that went into it, all our takes on every decision in this hand, not just these key decisions, you got to check out the breakdown presented by the Poker Guys. It's available on all your podcast apps. And if you like this video, make sure you subscribe to this YouTube channel. <laughs>